Buonasera, benvenuti. Good afternoon and welcome to this beautiful venue here in Rome and I would like to thank uh, all of those who have uh, made it possible for us to meet here at La Nuvola. Your Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch of uh, Constantinople, Your Holiness, uh, um, the Supreme Catholicos uh, of the Armenians, uh, Your Grace, uh, um, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, illustrious representatives of the great religions, uh, Madam Minister of the Interior, Luciana Lamorgese, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, in uh, opening this international uh, uh, conference of prayer and dialogue for peace, allow me to extend a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of the um, Sant'Egidio community. We decided to um, organize this event uh, despite the difficulties due to the global health emergency. The uh, positive effect uh, of the vaccination campaign uh, um, in Italy has meant that many people have been able to join us here today and this is already per se great news. being able to meet face to face, albeit with uh, some restrictions uh, um, in terms of social distancing and limited numbers and uh, with uh, um, a smaller number of uh, delegations, which however are extremely representative, so, is uh, an event in itself. There are representatives from 40 different countries present today and uh, this gives us hope after um, long months of separation and distance, after long months of lockdown and uh, um, a period during which social life almost came to a standstill. As our Spanish friends would say, we have to uh, make the most of this uh, good wave to re-establish and strengthen bonds of friendship and brotherhood which developed over the years um, in the spirit of Assisi. And uh, these uh, contacts were kept alive in various ways, uh, thanks to prayer, thanks to um, visits, thanks to uh, our commitment to think about the others for others. But of course we're delighted to be able to meet face to face because this enables us to um, make these bonds even stronger and uh, um, the meetings that will be held uh, tomorrow, given that we haven't met uh, in face to face for over a year, um, aim to foster the participation of as many people as possible with a more dynamic uh, um, approach uh, which will invite all to contribute. There will be also uh, less formal opportunities for contacts and exchanges uh, and this enriches our lives. Uh, and the strength of this event uh, is that it is not uh, um, an academic uh, forum. It is uh, a moment of community in which there is no juxtaposition uh, uh, between participants. It is an opportunity to work together, to live and prayer uh, together for our ultimate goal, that of a wo uh, world of peace. And this uh, gives us a sense of community, not because we're just talking about a community of men and women uh, present in 70 countries uh, organizing it, but uh, the reason is that our um, desire is that of uh, have a common destiny, um, common good, and uh, the Commonwealth Rabbi Jonathan Sachs uh, uh, declared that it is necessary to restore the common good in divided times. And that is why we decided that this event should be forward-looking. And the underlying question is how can we set the foundations for a new world while we're still suffering on account of the pandemic? There are very deep but um, wounds that have spared no people, no uh, nation, and uh, the high number of uh, victims, especially among the elderly, um, increase in the number of uh, uh, people who are without a job, children and young people without schools, 
uh, widespread social crisis, these are the wounds that affect the body of humankind. And we have a very clear responsibility, that of giving answers to help the world heal these wounds. And last year, in a far smaller event uh, because of the pandemic uh, held in Rome at the Campidoglio, together with Pope Francis, we declared no one is saved alone. And this is our starting point. If no one is saved alone. How can we start over together? And starting again together, starting over together, is uh, the theme of this opening session, which uh, features um, high-level speakers representing different uh, faiths and uh, world and political institution. The ecumenical patriarch uh, Bartholomew, who uh, over these years, uh, with his wisdom and interest, has followed the um, spirit of Assisi and who honors uh, the uh, community of Sant'Egidio with his friendship. Um, will be celebrating the 30th anniversary of his election uh, to the Ecumenical Patriarch, which will uh, be celebrated uh, uh, in the next few days. We're also honoured to have with us Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. We know his love for peace and his the way he has worked for peace, particularly in uh, South Sudan, where our community is also mediating. Thank you so much, Your Grace. And we also have the uh, Rabbi Pinchas Goldsmith, who is uh, um, committed to fighting all forms uh, of discrimination and racism. And he is very active in the area of uh, interfaith dialogue. Thank you so much, Rabbi. We also have uh, with us uh, the Al Azhar Grand Imam's uh, deputy, Mohammed uh, Al Duwaini. He represents a noble institution, a place of uh, Islamic uh, theological culture which uh, is unparalleled. Welcome to you. We also have with us Minister of uh, tolerance and coexistence of the United Arab Emirates uh, and uh, he, uh, he was the protagonist of the great event in Abu Dhabi with the signature of the um, Declaration on uh, Human Brotherhood uh, uh, signed by the Holy Father and uh, the great Imam al Tayyib. We also have with us uh, uh, the Minister of the Interior, Luciana Lamorgese, who in Italy is uh, uh, also responsible for relations between uh, the government uh, and uh, um, religious uh, denominations. And she uh, is very close to uh, our community, particularly when it comes to uh, reception and integration of migrants. Thank you so much for having joined us. We would like to start exploring um, opportunities uh, whereby the future um, of a human brotherhood uh, and care for uh, our earth uh, uh, can go hand in hand because this pandemic has caught us unawares. As Pope Francis said, we carried on regardless, thinking we would stay he healthy in a world that was sick. Therefore, there is the need to start again um, fresh so as not to waste the opportunity that this um, global crisis has uh, given us. We don't uh, want this to uh, be the beginning of uh, separation or degradation. We want this to be a new beginning. This is where we have to act uh, uh, responsibly as individuals but also as a community of uh, men and women of uh, different faiths. So we need to uh, start again together. We're not alone with our responsibilities and this is a value that we have to uh, acknowledge um, and this is our hope. I would like to draw a comparison between our conference uh, and uh, uh, what the um, Oriental uh, Christian tradition defines as a synod walking together. We're not here to discuss 
dogma or doctrine. We're here simply to talk about our future, the future of our young people, the future of our earth. Nicholas Escuse, a great humanist, uh, talked about uh, the meeting of uh, religious figures as a heavenly um, council. And we do this together because uh, we can only be saved uh, if uh, we are together. No one is saved alone. Tomorrow in the forum we will be exploring the different themes, uh, rediscovering others, uh, uh, possible uh, peace uh, um, questions that are linked to the environmental crisis. And for the first time this year we're going to hold a forum uh, with uh, young representatives of the different religions and their focus is going to be the future we want. We believe that listening to young people can help us all imagine uh, what the world is going to be like after the pandemic. Dear friends, thank you so much for having come here. It is so important to come together um, in this historic moment. There are significant social and human emergencies and we don't want to be inward looking. On the contrary, the spirit of Assisi over the years has shown that it is possible to look beyond our limited uh, world uh, and make uh, a significant contribution to our society. We uh, celebrated 29 uh, years of peace in Mozambique only a few days ago and we know that uh, a meeting such as this can make a fundamental contribution to peace. Uh, different religious faiths have walked together over these years and this is one of the extraordinary features of uh, our uh, times. Uh, and during our pilgrimage, uh, the empathy between people of different faiths uh, is a unique uh, um, feature of our history. And we have to recognise this and uh, be bold and show our vision and our commitment to uh, the common good at a time characterised by division and focus on our own needs. Uh, and there are many uh, selfish uh, um, individuals who are self-serving. We owe this to the poor, to the vulnerable, to the little ones who are suffering. The poor are invisible and they participate in a special way. Uh, they are those who uh, wish for peace and good and uh, cry for this in a silent uh, cry that others do not listen to. And this is what our community um, of Santa Gidio needs to pursue. We have to listen to this uh, appeal for peace and good and uh, bring this before the men and women of our times and before God. Thank you very much. And now I have the pleasure and honour of uh, ha handing over to the Minister of the Interior, Luciana Lamorgese. Good evening, everybody. I'm truly honoured to be able to speak at the opening session of uh, this international uh, conference for peace before such a highly qualified gathering which is called upon to speak up on uh, a topic uh, that is so fascinating and significant, peace. I would like to uh, extend a warm uh, greeting to all of the speakers and a special word of thanks uh, to the community of Sant'Egidio and particularly to uh, Professor Marco Impagliazzo, its president. I would like to pay him a special tribute because he has patiently woven a web of uh, um, relationships, uh, uh, bringing together um, people from different scenarios, from different contexts, so that uh, men and women from all over the world can look forward to a future of dignity and peace. I would like to mention in particular 
the successful experience of the humanitarian corridors for refugees uh, considered as uh, particularly vulnerable, and this was made possible thanks to the partnership between uh, the community of Santa Gita, the evangelical churches, the Ministry of the Interior, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this certainly is an example of best practices uh, uh, in uh, the uh, vast, uh, let's, say, um, let's say, area of policies for immigration and integration. And we know that the community of Asante Gidio's symbol um, is uh, um, the dove and uh, the rainbow, symbols of peace, and both invite us to nurture hope and uh, trust in humankind and to pursue uh, this uh, uh, without any fear. As uh, the gospel teaches us, peace uh, requires that we work patiently day after day. It is not a fruit uh, that is given to us. It is not something that can um, flourish without care and uh, attention. And those who wish to build peace have a very challenging task in uh, times like these, times characterized by violence, uh, um, persecution, conflict, uh, hate uh, um, speech, um, intolerance, uh, um, and this is something we see everywhere. Europe, which has uh, known peace thanks to the um, European Union, has uh, um, this notwithstanding uh, um, been faced with uh, bloody conflict uh, um, in the final years of the um, 20th century, as Pope Francis says, e even though we did not witness uh, a global conflict, uh, war has not been completely um, vanquished. Uh, um, it continues piecemeal. Armed conflicts are taking place in various parts uh, of our um, world, especially those areas where poverty, backwardness, uh, illiteracy, uh, disease, uh, hunger are um, tragic uh, plagues which affect so many. War is never just wherever it takes place, but it is particularly so for those peoples uh, um, that are affected by um, these plights. Uh, this is a twofold condemnation. Peace is, uh, as we know, something that can be um, pursued through words, words of peace. Words uh, are what uh, um, are humankind uh, is, um, say, characterized by. Words of peace uh, reject uh, uh, in offenses, sense of revenge, uh, and at the heart of this, there's the wisdom of the heart uh, and uh, mutual understanding. Peace has always uh, um, is pursued through dialogue, dialogue, and as we know, the significance of dialogue is a quest for the others. And this is because words uh, bring uh, other words in together. Uh, this is how to come together and uh, uh, seek reconciliation. A process is this uh, can uh, suffer setbacks. Uh, uh, there can be discouragement. There can be tension. There can be uh, defeat at times. But this is the only alternative. Women, political dissidents, uh, Ethnic or religious minorities, uh, members of gender communities are often the victims uh, that uh, are, as we know, targeted when the rules uh, of democracy and uh, um, coexistence are violated, bringing peace back to areas of the world where conflicts uh, deny hum fundamental human rights is the most difficult uh, and critical task, but it is uh, what, um, as a global community, we must uh, uh, attain. It is painful to see that there are numerous uh, uh, conflicts that stem from intolerance towards other uh, religions and uh, with uh, um, um, the idea of put, placing them in submission, the aim to spread peace and to preserve its pre precious uh, frailty is, uh, in this way, uh, insulted in uh, an unbearable fashion. So I would like to add that the minister 
or the Ministry of the Interior, does have a task to play in that respect, given the institutional mission that we have, that of pursuing social cohesion. And this task, uh, obviously, is pursued uh, ensuring that we preserve the secular nature of the state and we have to make sure that all individuals can uh, achieve uh, their, uh, let's say, fulfillment. That is why nobody uh, it must be left behind or excluded. Seeking cohesion means respecting differences and safeguarding minorities. An example of this is the creation of a fertile web of relations with the great uh, monotheist religions present in our countries. And with respect to the Islamic religion, a respect and the need of understanding uh, led the ministry to establish uh, a, an organization um, for Islam um, to establish uh, the best, let's say, approaches to guarantee peaceful uh, coexistence. Uh, cohesion is considered as, uh, um, let's say, peaceful uh, um, harmony between social groups and members of the national community. And this is uh, um, an important heritage which strengthens the roots of peace, peace which should uh, be nurtured by us all and by our country. And this is particularly so at a time in which the world has known the terrible uh, threats uh, stemming from the spread of the virus. Italy is one of the countries that has been most affected by um, the COVID pandemic, and now we're looking ahead with uh, confidence, uh, because I must say that um, despite these times we have lived, uh, there's always been uh, an understanding for the businesses, especially small businesses, that uh, have been uh, seriously affected by a, a lack of income and uh, in despair because uh, they felt that there was no uh, future. And uh, um, in the face of this, the government acted swiftly. And now there is great hope in the resources that uh, are being made available and that um, have already in part been allocated. I'm making reference to the uh, resources that come under the National Plan for Recovery and Resilience. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, the pandemic does not uh, generate structural uh, damage in our economy and in the distribution of wealth, uh, widening the gap between North and South and between different social classes. We are also aware that peace is only an empty word if we are indifferent in the face of material need and poverty and if this demand for justice uh, falls on deaf ears. The pandemic has uh, shown that uh, uh, we have to be humble. Uh, we cannot expect to be able to dominate the planet and everybody has been reminded that uh, we cannot uh, be um, saved alone and we have to also remember what uh, the Holy Father said uh, in the silence of uh, St. Peter's Square. We're all on the same boat. So once we can heal the world from the pandemic, we will uh, once again uh, experience the pleasure of uh, um, coming together. Uh, once again, we will be able to shake hands and uh, um, end that distance that has been necessary. So the key word for our future is together. This word is not just an invitation to share, but it is also an, an indication of the alliance that must be forged with future generations uh, that will follow us uh, and that uh, will have to shoulder the responsibility of continuing this common path. Each individual has to bring a, a brick to build a fair and peaceful community. And this must be done uh, uh, with awareness uh, of 
the fact that we are all united and interdependent. And as uh, Carl Gustav Jung uh, prophetically wrote at the end of his life, uh, all individuals know that they are the balance of all things. Your words um, uh, in this conference will remind us that we cannot do without others if we want to contribute to building, to creating a better world and nurturing a true uh, commonality of destiny and fate. And I think that together we can achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister, and thank you very much for the wishes that you expressed in the latter part of your remarks. Impressive remarks. Thank you for re recalling the importance of the word together, which is not only a word, but it's also a re the reality we should like to build in these few days. I now have the distinct honor to um, hand this over to His uh, Holiness, uh, Bartholomew I, the Archbishop of Constantinople and Ecumenical Patriarch. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you, Mr. President. Eminent and venerable representatives of the world's faiths, honorable representatives of states and world organizations, distinguished guests. Late in 2019, the world was shaken by news coming from Wuhan, China, where an unknown new odd disease was infecting a large number of people and was causing countless victims. In spite of the prevailing globalism, the planet was then facing great economic and financial crisis in uh, various areas of the world, characterized by tensions between and among great powers. Movements of whole populations and uh, increasingly Numerous migrations have been shaking the second decade of uh, the 21st century, have caused uh, negative repercussions, and have caused the onset of new and dormant nationalism amongst many peoples of the earth. Religious fundamentalism was trying to uh, annihilate the dialogue for peaceful co coexistence and cooperation amongst the faith. Unbridled economicism continued undeterred its unabated exploitation of natural resources, whose uh, consequences, whose impact upon the planet's climate are before all of our eyes. In this depressing context, we have seen the rapid, the, ons the rapid onset of uh, the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which has changed the planet's general perception, the insecurity caused by this new disease which spread throughout the world, the consequences of world lockdown that we had never thought of before, never even imagined before, have led to the emergence of new uh, understandings and perceptions amongst all of the world's people, peoples. No one, be he rich or poor, from the north or from the south of the world, may he or she belong to whatever cultural, religion, or political and economic order could assume that he or she would remain immune from this uh, 21st century scourge. Nowadays, we're slowly beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But I ask you, can we return
to the life of the previous world as though nothing had happened? Or will these events guide the lives of the Earth's people towards a different world in hopes that this may be a better world? Well, our reply, our answer to this question can be only one. The previous world simply is no longer, and we now hold in our hands an opportunity to build a new beginning. And this new beginning can but be together. As we meet here in this important gathering, we can but reaffirm principles that we are all very familiar with, but we are now under the obligation to translate such principles into a tangible reality. So let us uh, start again by affirming that which the pandemic has made even more obvious, that is uh, that we all belong to one and the same human family, of the family of all the Earth's people, and proclaim our care of creation. The creation has now been able to rest and renew itself and help us uh, find new life again in so many places where we wouldn't imagine we could find it up a, until a few months ago. A recent document by our ecumenical patriarchies proclaims that genuine, and I quote, genuine scientific progress in such realms as molecular biology, and in particular in genomics, have proven that the very notion of uh, different races or separate uh, genetic clades within uh, human species are a cruel fantasy, totally ungrounded in biology. The uh, poisonous notion of race is still endures as a part of the conceptual world of late modernity, but there is only one humankind to which all persons belong, and all of them are called upon as though they were one person to become a single people in God our Creator. Therefore, we must acknowledge all together, at all levels, not only the notion of human rights, but the fact that all men and women belong to one and the same mankind with all of its uh, diversities and its uh, multifarious cultures and identities. A post-pandemic new beginning must acknowledge this axiom, which uh, rejects every notion of difference or distinction and encourages us uh, to acknowledge ourselves as one family. In order to acknowledge the other, first of all, we need to understand the other in his and her cultural, social, ethical, traditional entirety. And to understand and know the other person's identity means first and foremost to listen to the other person, not with a view to uh, homogenizing them into one global identity, but in order to understand and embrace their distinctiveness. It is important to undertake a new path to globalization into which uh, modern communication systems have introduced us, and this not in order to raise barriers, but rather to protect the distinctive natures of every people, every territory, every land and culture, not to, l not to withdraw within ourselves, which is a danger ever present in many societies, but in order to help others understand this and to relate with it. Now, a system of relations which is based upon understanding and knowing the other 
has in itself an ability to harmonize even extremes. And this has been proven uh, openly by the pandemic because it has created new forms of economy, more mindful of the people's needs, the challenges of poverty, the opportunity to avoid pointless migrations as long, of course, as the circumstances of life can be deemed at least acceptable, to the opportunity of sharing, respecting the economic principles which rule and uh, determine the choices in the various countries, to, the, um, to all persons benefiting from the goods of the earth without ever incurring in uh, the exploitation of other human beings and of resources, as these are oftentimes causes of conflict. The post-pandemic world should also, I think, produce a third principle besides knowledge and understanding. And the third principle is mutual respect. Thank you very much. And let me reiterate this. The third principle must be mutual respect. To respect and to respect oneself. To uh, enter into a dialogue and to listen to each other makes uh, the above principles translatable into reality, overcoming religious fundamentalism, absolute nationalism, asserting fair justice at every, at every level in, in uh, human society, creating moments of cultural, mutual cultural enrichment may indeed lead mankind to new achievements in view of a life that may be uh, worthy of human knowledge and mutual coexistence in every realm of life. The Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church, held in Crete in 2016, solemnly proclaimed that, the, and I quote, the gifts of peace and justice re depend also on human synergy and that, and I quote again, Every man and woman, irrespective of his or her color, religion, faith, race, sex, nationality, language, every man and woman was created in God's image and likeness and enjoys exactly the same rights in society as everyone else. End of quote. Men and women of faith, politicians, economists, philosophers and sociologists, environmentalists, scientists and men and women of goodwill, after every turmoil that history has ever witnessed, human societies have had a chance to emerge improved and to progress in the growth in all realms or, on the contrary, to uh, withdraw within themselves to exclude each other and thus open the gates to new conflicts and problems. After this pandemic, we are faced with exactly the same question. Do we wish to know each other, understand each other, and respect each other, so as uh, to give the peoples of the world a new opportunity to live with justice and in peace, protecting creation and all that flows from it? If we do not, then the consequences will be worse than the world that we have left behind. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention. Thank you, Your Holiness, for your words that truly, I think, provided us with uh, directions in order to imagine tomorrow's world. You have said so with great strength and wisdom, 
and thank you very much also because for the past decades you have been one of the leading figures of the great civil, human and spiritual battle for the protection and salvation of creation. Thank you. We will hold on to your words as a valuable treasure for our days together. Thank you so very much, Your Holiness. And now I have the distinct pleasure to uh, turn this over, to hand this over to His Grace Justin Walby, the, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Primate of the Church of England. Your Grace, please. Distinguished guests, Gentili ospiti, eh, veramente per me. We heard from uh, Minister Lamoghese and from His All Holiness. You can know now that I'm going to say similar things to both of those contributions, so please feel free to have a little sleep before the next good <laughs> contribution. There is a painting by an English artist, yes, there are some, called George Watts, which is entitled After the Deluge. In it, a huge sun bursts through the clouds. It is meant to depict a scene from Noah's flood. The day that Noah opens the window to find the flood is over and to see a return to normality. Crucially, it is a seascape. The water is still there, but the light of recreation dominates. God's hand is seen in so clearly amidst the hope and chaos. We have truly faced the deluge in the last two years. The flooding away of all we knew and all that felt familiar, the impact of the pandemic will be felt for decades. The explosion of the last two years will be followed by the fallout. It will, of course, be a seminal moment in modern epi epidemiology, but many of us will be affected more obviously through our daily lives, in our memories, in our culture, in travel, even in our working habits and how we relate to others. These huge events and their aftershocks will inevitably shape us not only as individuals but our communities and countries for years to come. A number of the effects have been felt immediately, massively, painfully, as the bricks of normality, so-called, all came crashing down, our sense of our own fragility, our grief and our mortality was felt for many of us like never before. The idols of our age, whether health or science or prosperity or any of the other distractions, we can fall into the trap of assuming are omnipotent. Those idols were toppled and revealed themselves as powerless. In the Christian Bible, in the Gospel of St. Matthew at the end of chapter 7, Jesus tells a story of two people. One is a man who builds his house on rock, hard work. But when the floods come and the storm blows, the house stands and is safe. The other builds his house on sand. It's easy, but when the floods come, and the storm rages, the house collapses. We have built our societies in the West and at the cost of the global South on sand. Will we be so foolish as to rebuild on the same sand? 
In our separation, we have felt keenly the importance of being together. I feel that joy of assembling together, of seeing people from above the waist, rather than only on Zoom. Let's not lose sight of the importance of fellowship and cooperation, the ties that bind us together, which are deeper than background, race, class, gender, party politics, or anything else, for we are all one human race. In the face of one common threat, people and local communities came together to help and serve one another. Sant'Egidio I visited yesterday evening and saw the beauty of the work of their volunteers. The issues of vaccine equity and unequal access to health services show sadly and clearly how capable we still are of greed, of stupidity, of forsaking our neighbor, even when it will cost us more in the future. COVID-19 exposed a deep desire to preserve ourselves, even though most people accept that the pandemic will not stop anywhere until it stops everywhere. Both nationally and globally, the pandemic has stripped bare the paper that covered the cracks in our society. It reveals the places where inequality and injustice have made their home in the darkness of ignorance and selfishness. And at the same time, it has revealed unexpected joys our resilience, our ability to adapt and innovate in the face of great and sudden change. And this era in which we live is a time of extraordinary and rapid change, which has been hugely accelerated by the pandemic. We've seen changes that scientists did not expect for 10, 20, even 100 years. Change that seemed like science fiction only 10 or 20 years ago. Autonomous forms of transport are now practical, not only for vehicles, but also for ships and aircraft. Artificial intelligence, machine learning are advancing rapidly. And these raise questions for human beings regarding their identity, their purpose, and what it means to be human. Communications are unrecognizable, hugely powerful, and immensely subversive of existing orders and structures of many societies and institutions. But they also allow to challenge the powerful to reveal corruption, to help us see truth. Medicine is advancing ever more rapidly as the decoding of the human genome begins to bear fruit. For most of us and our children and grandchildren, these changes will be revolutionary for jobs, development, and life expectancy, but also for the terrible possibilities of war or the wonderful gifts of peace. At the same time, the planet groans under the weight of the peoples and economies that it sustains. Social tensions grow as traditional societies and structures resist or seek to adapt to change. We face many paradoxes. We are more connected, but we are more alone. We live in a time of unimaginable wealth, but desperate poverty. We are more climate aware than we have ever been, but we are only just beginning to think about the possibility of changing our actions and habits on climate change. This is a tide that will turn as churches, governments, and people begin to understand that climate change 
can, within 50 years, make the world almost uninhabitable, move not just the 80 million refugees of today, but a billion or a billion and a half refugees out of the hottest areas of the world. And already we are seeing that beginning more and more. These issues are related. They, they are linked by the fact that we have not loved and valued all people equally in the world. We do not value the gifts that God has given us. We have not seen the face of God in every person. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. If we rebuild on this basis, we will build an even worse destination. War, famine, plague, and natural disaster will be our evil gift to future generations. But, but the opportunity lies before us. At this time in history, unlike anything any of us will ever have experienced, to seize this moment of change and shape it so that our world serves, not rules, those who are poor and marginalized, so that we care for our environment, so that we are drawn ever closer together and not pushed apart by false promises and idols. As Abraham Lincoln said, we can destroy our enemies by making them our friends. Now we must find... Now we must find from events such as this, fresh strength, passionate commitment to imagine ourselves afresh, to reimagine what we are in such change to reimagine anything at such time of change and with so many impulses and pressures requires us to have constant values which are expressed flexibly. It does not happen by accident. We, we need still greater imagination to grasp this moment. We need leadership at every level of society and courage to stand for what is right, not just what may seem easy. Such leadership is political, yes, but also religious. Such leadership is sacrificial. It is honest. It is networked, as faith groups are the best equipped to reimagine, to rebuild, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Matthew again, Matthew's Gospel again, chapter 12. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. A world that rips itself apart in greed, in ignorance, in cruelty and selfishness and disregard for others will not stand for anyone. And where the living stones that are the human beings of this world cleave together to create an unbreakable structure we will endure for the common good of all. Yet today we see that climate change is a driver of conflict. Hence these prayers for peace. Hence these prayers in which we must not say, as is almost written in Isaiah, here am I, send them but as is written in Isaiah, here am I, send me. Whether we are ready or not, we are entering into a new world, the possibility of a creation reborn. The French philosopher Jacques Maritain said, a man of courage flees forward 
in the midst of new things. Let us take action together. Act now, as Saint Egidio and so many others have shown us. May these new things be new opportunities for us to draw near to God, to learn from each other, to love our neighbor. May we be people of courage, fleeing together boldly forward to shape the challenges and chances that lie before us. We are the blessed generation, for we have the chance to shape a world of justice. That's it. Grazie molte a Justin Welby per... Thank you very much, Your Grace, for this vision you have shared with us. Thank you for having um, contributed to this discussion. Thank you for having reminded us that every society, every community must be built on solid rock. And thank you so much for your commitment to peace in many parts of the world. And now I have the pleasure and the privilege of uh, introducing a guest uh, who is with us for the first uh, time. And we're talking about the Minister of Tolerance and Coexistence of the United Arab Emirates, uh, His Excellency Nahyan bin Mubarak al Nahyan, who uh, was also, uh, let's say, a leading uh, um, figure uh, in the Abu Dhabi event uh, in February 2019. I would like to also remind you that in Abu Dhabi, construction is underway and we will see together the, a church, uh, a mosque and a synagogue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sisters and brothers in humanity, peace and God's blessings and compassion be upon you all. It gives me a great pleasure to convey to you the greetings and best wishes of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. I also relay to you the greetings and best wishes of all your friends and colleagues in the United Arab Emirates. We are proud. We are proud of the friendly and peaceful relations between our country and all peoples of the world. Together, as brothers and sisters, in humanity, we seek to build bridges of understanding, coexistence, and brotherhood. We are delighted to participate in this important conference that brings together religious leaders, scholars, clerks, and intellectuals for dialogue and joint action for the benefit of the world. As I stand in front of you today, I am reminded of a verse in the Holy Quran that says in translation, had God willed, he could have made you a single community, but in order to test, to test you and what he revealed to you, so why with one another and virtues and good works. No nation, no society, no community will peacefully convert everyone to a single religious belief. And no great country or society would attempt it. The best we can do 
and it is the very good, is to bow with one another in virtue and good works. We do well when we work together across the lines of difference for the benefit of humanity. We do well when we strengthen human contact, engage in constructive dialogue and cooperation, and, and, do all we, and do all we can do to preserve human dignity. We do well together when we go forward with determination to see that all people have a positive future to look forward to as a member of one human family. These values and principles are the, are the core of my country's vision for its present and its future. Our founding president, the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, a man of wisdom and foresight, clearly exemplified these values and principles throughout his life. His successor, the current leaders of our country, continue to guide the United Arab Emirates with these values and principles at the forefront. In the United Arab Emirates, we believe that the, there is a great and vast field in which we can act together with the rest of the world in defending and promoting these moral values and principles which are a vital part of our common human heritage. You will find in my country a unique and successful model of peaceful and productive coexistence among people of diverse religions, cultures, nationalities, and backgrounds. And as testimony to our commitment to tolerance, we have created the world's first and only Ministry of Tolerance and Coexistence, of which I'm proud to be its minister. We are committed to work with all individuals and with all nations to ensure uh, the genuine respect and compassion for the dignity of every human being and to preserve the fundamental human rights for all. This noble quest for human fraternity was on the minds of His Holiness the Pope and His Eminence the Sheikh of Al-Azhar when they issued the Abu Dhabi Declaration on Human Fraternity in 2019. This historic document reaffirms the importance of creating a truly human fraternity, a global society where all live and work together as brothers and sisters in harmony, peace, and goodwill. We thank His Holiness the Pope, Pope Francis, and His Eminence, Imam Ahmed Atayyib, for giving the world this important document that is a celebration of human unity and the human quest for a better, more peaceful, and prosperous world. Thank you. Thank you. Friends and colleagues, as we look to religious and cultural dialogue at this conference, let us turn our attention to our individual and national capacity to build peace. Let us see that there is more that binds us together than separate us, and that our similarities are far greater than our differences. Let us declare our commitment to find a common ground necessary to heal and prevent the conflicts that can truly threaten humanity. In far too many places throughout the world, 
religious and cultural differences provide suspicion, where instead it should promote appreciation of our common quest for spiritual, uh, spirit, spiritual fulfillment. It sometimes appears that our religious differences have become sources of intractable conflict rather than the basis for mutual respect and the common ground for problem solving. I sincerely hope that through your discussions at this conference, we will see actions and outcomes that will unleash the power of tolerance and human fraternity to change hearts and minds. Furthermore, I hope that you will be resolute in identifying, identifying stra strategies that will lead to governments and individuals adopting and practicing the elements of tolerance and religious freedom, welcoming diversity, and heterogeneously practicing inclusion, exhibiting honest and curiosity about and respect for those unlike us. When this happens, we will truly have a, globe, a global human fraternity. This conference, ladies and gentlemen, reminds us of what we have long recognized in the United Arab Emirates, that tolerance and peaceful coexistence need our constant effort to support it and make it an integral part of our lives. We know that tolerance does not flourish without hard work. For example, my ministry and my country are focused on ensuring that the educational experience of our young men and women results in their understanding, their understanding the necessary value of tolerance. We are likewise concentrating on promoting tolerance in all forms of communication. We wish to build local and global partnerships based on a tolerance that realize the potential of diversity. We undertake continuous social and legislative initiatives that fight hate, promote mutual respect, and celebrate our shared human values. We are committed to increasing our understanding and respect for those who are different from us, and we always seek to help others understand us. Tolerance requires the courage to confront the unknown, to cast aside suspicion and instead embrace diversity, because tolerance towards the, rewards the courageous with peace, harmony, and prosperity. We pray to the Almighty God to help us in our efforts to spread these universal global values and to help us achieve international harmony and peace. We pray to the Almighty God to strengthen our ability to help those who are in need regardless of their politics, their ideology, or their religion. We pray for human unity and cooperation in the face of all challenges, including those posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. May our prayers inspire hope in our hearts and in the hearts of those we seek to serve. May God help us to reach out to one another in a spirit of human fraternity as we commit to living together in peace, safety, and good health. I am deeply honored to be here with you and offer my thanks and gratitude to the organizers and the sponsor of this important conference. Thank you all for your participation and for your contribution to peace and human and harmony in our world. May God, peace, compassion, and blessing be with you all. Thank you and God bless.
Grazie, signor Ministro, per... Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your words and for your testimony. Thank you for the insight that you and your country had to create this unique, unprecedented ministry within the whole uh, Arabian Peninsula, and which we hope uh, will open many new paths in uh, other countries under your guidance. Thank you very much indeed for coming here and uh, for taking the floor before all of us. And I now have uh, the distinct pleasure to introduce uh, the great Rabbi Pinchas Goldsmith, the chairman of the Conference of European Rabbis. We met him uh, shortly before the uh, onset of uh, the pandemic at San Egidio here in Rome for uh, on the occasion of uh, an important award that uh, the uh, Conference of European Rabbis uh, gave uh, to the community of San Egidio. On that occasion, dear great rabbi, we have been uh, made familiar with your wisdom, and we are looking forward to listening to your words. One of the few positive aspects of the corona times is that I can walk in the streets with a mask on and not being recognized. So this conference organized in a spirit of Assisi by the community of Sankt Egidio and its president would like first of all to thank for inviting me it's the first time to participate in this conference. We are meeting at times where the world we have known has turned upside down. The good news are that humanity survived this pandemic in a much better way than the bubonic plague and the Black Death, and thanks to the collaboration of scientists and medical researchers from the world over, vaccines have been produced, and the medical world is in the process of finding the right medical cocktail to heal corona. The bad news are that millions of people died and the pandemic continues to affect the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It is our hope and prayer that unlike previous pandemics which brought great political instability, revolutions, wars, pogroms, that now the citizens of the world we all, we are the citizens of this world, will come together in fraternity and responsibility. As we look for sources of wisdom and counsel from the words of the Bible, we go to the beginning, to the Genesis where the creation of man immediately brought to situations of conflict and hate. As the Torah recalls the story of the first two brothers, Cain and Abel, it records a religious conflict between the two, both trying to build an exclusive relationship with God without the other, without the brother, creating a conflict which culminated in murder and exile. This is also the story of humankind and our civilization. For millennia, we went to war to bring the true faith 
with love to the other. However, unfortunately, even today, in our post-Judean Christian age, in our secular age, the era of religious warfare is not over yet. We live in the 21st century, which since inception was marked by hate, terrorism, and conflict in the name of God, led by false prophets who promised to return of humanity to the Garden of Eden by reviving barbaric and inhuman practices from over a thousand years ago. These false prophets ignited whole regions with hate and mayhem, bringing suffering to millions of people and especially to women. What should be our answer to this new face of religion which endangers the peace and well-being of millions of the citizens of our world. We can speak of peace, but neutrality and inactivity and silence in the face of evil is by itself also evil. Today, I came from Kiev, where Ukraine and the world is commemorating 80 years of the atrocities of Babi Yar. I remember that 30 years ago, I visited with the Nobel Peace Laureate, Professor Elie Wiesel, a friend, the then president of the newborn democracy of Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk. And Elie Wiesel asked the question, Babi Yar was not like Auschwitz in a different, in a field far away from civilization. It was in the center of a city where millions lived. How come there was not one door which opened up to save a child, to save a girl, to save a grandmother? It was in the middle of a city. Silence in the face of evil is also evil. We are concluding tomorrow our deliberations in one of the most magnificent buildings of civilizations, of our civilization in the Colosseum of Rome. For us Jews, the Colosseum has extra significance as it was built by the Emperor Vespasian, the conqueror of Judea, using Jewish prisoners of war as builders and the treasury of the Jerusalem temple to finance this stadium. Truly our ancestors were great construction workers since not only did the Colosseum survive the ravages of time, but even the pyramids in Egypt, built 13th centuries earlier by Jewish slaves in Egypt, are still around. It would be an ideal moment to advertise this trade of our ancestors, if not that contemporary Jews are today free to practice other professions, among them my colleague, the Chief Rabbi of Rome, who is a medical professional. On a more serious note, the Colosseum, the important remnant of Roman culture, is the institution of antiquity which provided family entertainment by showing human suffering. Celebrating bloodshed and death and desecrating the sanctity of human life. It is therefore very beneficial that the community of San Egidio has initiated this gathering here in Rome, along with many other initiatives, rising to the biblical call of, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am my brother's keeper. Calling out to the responsibility of each one of us has for the other, 
to preserve life, to preserve peace, replacing silence with the word, replacing solitude with partnerships, and replacing the fear of the other with that of hope and friendship. We recall with pride and joy the prize in the name of Rabbi Moshe Rosen given to the founder of St. Egidia, my friend Professor Andrea Riccardi, for this monumental work in making this world a better place. I would like also to express my sincere appreciation to the community of St. Egidia and its president for your continuing support for the remembrance of the Shoah the struggle against recurring anti-Semitism, and your support for the Jewish community of Europe to maintain the freedom of Jewish practice and hence the possibility to think about the European Jewish future. It is with a deeper and new understanding that we read from anew the book of Genesis, the beginning and the basis of the Bible and of Judaism, how our patriarch Abraham opened his tent to all four sides, inviting strangers, and the patriarch Jacob, removing the obstacles to the most important commodity of the Middle East, but also of the world, fresh water, to give access to the stranger and to the disadvantaged alike. Public philosopher Yuval Noah Harari made an observation regarding corona, that while the medical and scientific world came together to fight and find a remedy against the virus, states and political entities, as His Grace, the Archbishop of Canterbury has said, have drawn apart and tried to isolate themselves from the outside world each country going its own wing, combating the virus. But if there's one thing which this vicious and treacherous virus taught the world, it is the total interdependence of humanity. Even if rich countries will vaccinate each one of their citizens, ignoring the third world, a new mutation coming from there might render the vaccine irrelevant and obsolete. COVID-19 taught to all of us humility and vulnerability. Mankind, which was able to reach the planet Mars, was humiliated by this unseen microscopic creature creating havoc in our lives. But the virus also reminded us of our interdependence on each other. How much did we miss the smile, the hug, of mothers and daughters, sons and grandsons, and kisses of our loved ones. This interdependence of humanity has also to be manifested in our care for the environment and the great task of saving our planet and its inhabitants from the perils of global warming. For too long have we tried to ignore this mounting challenge hoping it would go away. It's like a person having a toothache, thinking if he's not going to do anything about it, it's going to go away. Yes, the teeth are going to go away, if we will not discuss this. He as well, all of humanity is being asked to join hands with our cohabitants of our planet to ensure that this beautiful world of us, which God has created for us, will be inhabitable for generations to come. I know that during the meetings of Assisi, the issue of nuclear disarmament has always come to the forefront. And being the chief rabbi of Moscow, I know that this has always been, it still is, a very important issue. But I would like to say one sentence about the subject. Other than during the Cold War, the greatest danger is not the arsenals available to the superpowers or those countries still thinking of themselves as superpowers. Today you have more 
countries thinking they are superpowers than actual superpowers. Because those superpowers, they amassed those nuclear weapons for MAD, for mutual assured destruction, which was an insurance that those weapons will never be used. However, today, if you have movements which are suicidal, mutual assured destruction is not a threat, it is a promise. And therefore, we have to make sure that individuals and organizations and states which are influenced by this ideology will not get those nuclear weapons and make this planet a very dangerous place. And in conclusion, as we are returning slowly from our Zoom holes and bunkers and from individual worship to public and communal services and life, we should cherish our human interdependence and commonality. This new world developing after this pandemic should take a lesson from the first two brothers in the Bible from Cain and Abel, that a relationship to God is only possible if it encompasses the other, and not only the one other, everyone together. It has to encompass our fellow men and women in all the continents and in the whole world. And I would like finally to quote a piece of the prayer, the New Year's prayer of the Jewish rite. V'yasu kulam aguda achat la'asot ratzuncha belevav shalem. That we should all get together, come together, and be friends in peace in order to be with God in a full heart. Thank you very much. Grazie, Signora. Thank you very much, Rabbi, for your remarks and for having reminded us in all your wisdom how we are all interdependent. And you also rightly stressed the significance of togetherness. And this is something that all the speakers have uh, stressed. I would like to take this opportunity to greet uh, Riccardo Di Segni, uh, Chief Rabbi of Rome. And we also have with us uh, the uh, president of the uh, Italian Jewish community, Noemi Insegne, and the president uh, of the Roman Jewish community, uh, Ruth Duraghella. And now I would like to call on uh, Mohammed al Duaini, al Azar Grand Imam's deputy, Egypt. This is. Uh, wonderful institution, as I said in my opening address. The wisdom of Islam is its trademark, and it uh, educates generations and generations of uh, people in the Islamic faith. We also have uh, uh, the privilege of having tomorrow with us uh, uh, Imam Al-Taib of the Colosseum tomorrow. But in the meantime, I would like to welcome and acknowledge Muhammad al duwaini Thank you. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, uh, our Prophet Muhammad's prayers be upon you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring you the greetings of uh, um, the Imam, great Sheikh Al Hazar, Professor Dr. Hamakhid Al Tayeb, may God preserve him and uh, keep him in good health. Professor Ahmed Al Tayeb has asked me to 
speak on his behalf and has asked me to convey uh, his greetings. Wish you all a very successful conference. I would like to start by expressing my thanks for this wonderful opportunity I am given to um, reflect on uh, what our society has experienced following the uh, coronavirus pandemic, which has affected all uh, sectors, our economy, our society, our feelings, our, our emotions, and I am torn by two contradicting feelings. Firstly, I experience pain and sadness for all those people who have been affected by this terrible uh, uh, epidemic, which um, was not stopped by borders. It was not uh, in fear of the power of armies, and there was uh, no uh, nationality. I prayed God Almighty that he may free us. And the second feeling is one of hope and optimism, knowing that we all share the same origin, and we share all that makes life better and more beautiful for all. And this is the single origin that we read about in the Quran when uh, we read, we have created you from a male and a female and made you tribes and families that you may know each other. Surely the noblest of you with Allah is the most dutiful of you. Surely Allah is knowing, aware. So we must uh, uh, set aside the thoughts that the coronavirus has introduced uh, into our minds and in our hearts, and we must learn from the lesson of the coronavirus, understand that we all share the same uh, uh, fate. And I would like to uh, make reference to the messenger of God, uh, the prophet, who drew a comparison uh, between uh, those uh, who put into practice what uh, had to be done to uh, people that had conquered uh, a ship. The example is uh, that of some who uh, got seats in the upper part of the ship and others in the lower. And uh, when uh, the latter needed water, they had to go and bring it up to uh, those on the upper deck, saying we're going against our destiny, but we're not uh, going to harm others. Had they done this, uh, all would have died, but had they uh, been helped, uh, they would have all uh, saved, as was the case. So um, this is the eloquent message. Each individual has a task and uh, all have to work together uh, to achieve our common goals. Ladies and gentlemen, this virus has affected us all without asking for anyone's permission. And our community, especially leaders, the wise, uh, and the scholars must uh, understand that um, globalization, which divides peoples, is uh, um, a figment of our imagination and that the clash of civilization is a lie. That civilization is not about excluding one um, group um, and allowing another to prevail because it is the result of humankind as a whole and the alternative to uh, stifling globalization uh, and uh, assumed clash is a fruitful uh, meeting of minds and dialogue um, between civilizations and we have a common origin even though our languages and ideas might be different and our duty as a universal community is seeking um, good for us all. And this is something we can do with meetings of this kind because we can overcome our, our crises and uh, finally achieve cooperation and stability in our nations, uh, disseminating principles such as uh, justice uh, and equality with no discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the foundations of Islam is uh, ensuring that different peoples may know each other, communicate and uh, coexist. And this is also a universal social need. We don't have any uh, time 
um, no choice before us. Uh, this is a luxury we can't afford. If we don't defeat epidemics through collaboration, we will all be in danger, and civil and constructive communication must uh, go beyond uh, a mere uh, slogans to uh, deliver real results, and uh, this must be an exchange of experience and uh, uh, goods amongst nations. Al Azhar rejects the theory of the clash of civilizations and invites all to uh, commit to genuine peace. Uh, we promote uh, contacts with all institutions, fostering an exchange of ideas and uh, views to consolidate the values of coexistence, acceptance of others, uh, rejection of violence, fight against extreme extremism and uh, strengthening of uh, pillars of citizenship and uh, um, adopting a genuine dialogue which invests in intellectual pluralism and cultural diversity, recognizing uh, that we all have uh, a uniqueness uh, and uh, um, identities that we have to respect. Uh, thanks to these human values, al Hazar has uh, obtained extraordinary uh, results in Egypt and uh, elsewhere. al Hazar has played uh, a special role in the fight against uh, the coronavirus pandemic, raising awareness on its dangers, stressing the need to tackle it with different scientific approaches, starting with uh, uh, collaboration, uh, dissemination of information, and and adoption of uh, preventive measures. Ladies and gentlemen, now more than ever, our world needs bridges to bring different peoples together to foster cooperation. And this is possible only provided that uh, we agree on uh, our common values uh, so as to tackle the consequences and the challenges that have arisen on account of the pandemic. And in particular, we must share um, success stories. I have uh, um, for you some recommendations which I think um, are worth uh, stressing. First of all, we have to uh, encourage all peoples, governments and organisations to promote universal participation with uh, scientific uh, programmes and awareness raising to um, support the efforts made by um, institutions starting with family and uh, um, schools and universities and social organizations. Secondly, we have to exchange knowledge, information and experience, exchange goods um, such as uh, um, pharmaceuticals and uh, instruments uh, to tackle catastrophes and epidemics. Uh, this must